I was a loner when I was your age too, my mom said. She was full of shit. I knew she had friends because she had maintained friendships with the girls she was friends with at my age. I had met them. I had heard them talking about the wild adventures they had when they were my age. Plus, she got pregnant with me when she was 17, which required, I assumed, at least passable social skills. No, I really was, she said. I would go to parties and sit in the corner and read a book, and all of my friends would be like, what are you doing reading that book? Come dance. The last party I'd been to was a birthday party almost two years earlier, where I accidentally admitted I liked the band Aqua when everyone was talking about a rapper who had a song with a similar sounding title, and everyone had looked around at one another like, this moron thinks we're talking about Barbie Girl. I don't think it counts as being a loner if you got invited to parties and your friends were upset that you weren't hanging out with them enough. You'll get invited to parties. You're just at an awkward age. I wanted to believe her. I'd had friends just a couple of years before, after all. I'd gotten invited to sleepovers, been asked to promise my allegiance to insecure friends, regularly knocked on the bedroom windows of people from school at 1 a.m., and been greeted with enthusiasm. I had done these things easily, unfazed by how I was being perceived. Now I was 14, and everything had changed. 14, I thought, shaking my head in agreement with myself. You tricky bitch. But quickly I remembered all the 14-year-olds I knew at school, the ones who had sex with one another and skipped class to get drunk with their older boyfriends, or the ones who brought their guitars to school to show their friends what they had practiced the night before, or the ones who were able to hold conversations with their adult science teacher while posing for Polaroids in the garden, or even the ones who got together during lunch hour to quiz each other about vocabulary words. It wasn't the age that was awkward. I was awkward. My mom was trying to make me believe I was normal, that my age was to blame for my complete social ineptness, but I wasn't normal. There was no guarantee I would ever have friends again. I'm sorry, she said. This is my fault. I should have been more social when you were growing up. I tried to imagine a reality in which, because my mom was social while I was growing up, I did not turn into the strange loner freak that I was. It would be nice to have some outside force to blame, but in some ways it was even more comforting in the way things became comforting through habit to blame only myself. At least the spoon thing was going well. I counted off the days as if I were a recovering alcoholic. 15 days without spoons, four months without spoons, five months without using spoons, and 10 days since I accidentally touched a spoon when carelessly grabbing a fork from the dishwasher. If the spoon thing was a cry for help, it was a weak, internal cry. I knew it probably signified something sad and desperate about my personality. The spoon thing, the assignment of the slightest, dumbest handicap to myself, was a reminder that I was both in control and out of control, that I could force myself to behave a certain way for months on end for no reason, that I was that easy for my own self to manipulate. This is so stupid, I would think, and the thought would immediately be followed by, but alas, this is also who I've chosen to be. I was trying to gain dominance over myself as a way to prove that there was a difference between my intentions and my actions, as a way to prove that I was not really who it was starting to seem like I was. The spoon thing, of course, wasn't who I was. It was like a fake, fake lip ring or an ill-advised pair of suspenders, an accessory to compensate for my actual personality, a disguise to conceal the flaws I didn't know how to address. It was a distraction from my real personality defects, something I could identify as the source of my weirdness and my problems, but that was actually a symptom of the larger problems I did not want to deal with. Also, it made it really hard to eat school hot lunch because the cafeteria only offered sporks, which I had decided counted as a spoon three days into my spoon thing. I made friends with three Mexican girls. One of them, Angelica, was assigned to be my partner in English class, and she told me she would find me at lunch so we could finish our history assignment. She found me on my bench and ate with me. Then she asked me to follow her to the locker room where her two best friends were hanging out. I talked with Angelica most days in class, and sometimes I abandoned my bench to hang out with them in the locker room. I was hoping to become close enough to them that I would have people to hang out with during summer break, which was fast approaching. They mostly spoke Spanish unless they had something to say directly to me, which meant I didn't have to listen to their conversations unless someone said my name first, which I thought was neat. They were big on cute little nicknames, and they called me Chelso. Chelso, there's your boyfriend. 
Angelica said, pointing to Jake, the boy I had agreed to date months earlier and hadn't talked to since. They all laughed and said something in Spanish and then lightly pushed me on the arm, the way close-knit teenage girls did in tampon commercials. I avoided eye contact with Jake and saw from the corner of my eye that he was avoiding eye contact with me. Did that Jake guy ask you out, my mom said. No, I said. How did you know that? He's in my third period. Maybe he was in her third period, but there was no way he'd volunteered that information to my mom. I looked at her suspiciously. Did Angelica tell you? I said. Jake is really sweet. I like his sideburns. Mrs. Johnson's daughter, will you go to prom with me? Daniel said to me on our mid-morning break. Yeah, I said. I hadn't meant to respond so quickly or in the affirmative, but what else do you say to the cute, popular idiot who is perpetually making you feel like you're not in on the same hilarious joke that is most likely being made at your expense when he asks you out to be his prom date? You say no, my inner monologue reminded me, because he sucks and you hate him, and probably no one has ever put him in his place. My quick yeah was confirmation that there was some part of me that wanted Daniel to accept me and make me cool and popular like him. That I wanted him to sweep me away on prom night and convince me over the course of the evening that he was misunderstood, that his good looks caused a lot of personality problems for him, and that he was trying to identify and overcome those problems, and that he wanted me to be a part of that journey with him. Daniel sauntered away from me toward his laughing male posse, confirming my suspicion that I was the butt of a poorly conceived, mean-spirited joke or that this was a medium pathetic way for Daniel to gauge his own popularity. I'll try to remember to go, I yelled, exposing my desperate need to appear indifferent. I stood in the courtyard with a blank expression, trying to figure out if I appeared unaffected or deeply affected, then wondered if it made any difference to anyone which one I appeared to be, and then considered which feeling I was actually feeling, then considered what I appeared to be feeling now to people who saw me standing in the middle of the courtyard by myself for over a minute, then looked around to see who might be wondering about my feelings about standing in the courtyard, then checked back in with myself to see what my feelings were. Still not sure, I thought. The second bell rang while I stood there, indicating that I was late to class. Let's kick this spoon thing up a notch, my inner monologue said. I had gone without spoons for eight months and I barely gave it a thought anymore. It didn't feel like a restriction anymore. I needed to make it laborious again. Knives could be an interesting utensil to live without. How would I cut things or spread them? Going without both knives and spoons could pose some interesting challenges. I could overcome those challenges by refusing to see them as challenges and instead calling them accomplishments. Maybe these accomplishments could shed some light on what kind of person I wanted to be because I obviously couldn't figure that out on my own. Maybe I could stop using kitchen utensils of any kind and prepare and eat all my food with my fingers. Maybe eating with my fingers would be less gimmicky and more authentic, a punk rock FU to institutionalized utensil implementation. No, I thought confidently, maybe a little sternly, this is where I draw the line. By the end of the year, students started ditching their classes to hang out in my mom's science room slash garden. There would be no more classwork, she decided, only gardening and socializing. She left the door to the classroom and the door to the garden open. Bright summer light streamed in from both sides of the room and students drifted in and out of the classroom. Teachers of neighboring classrooms began to complain about the noise, but my mom didn't change her policies. A student stepped on one of the class computers while dancing on top of a desk, and my mom hid the broken computer under some boxes of barely used microscopes so that the school administration wouldn't find it until the year was over and she was no longer responsible for the science equipment. Just try to be cool, she pleaded with her students. The year's almost over. Daniel and the other jocks asked my mom what she was doing for the summer and invited her to ride sea dews with them on the lake. My mom happily agreed and told them to call her, but she didn't give them our phone number. I wondered if Daniel was trying to get my mom's number as a means to reach me, or if he was attempting to get me to fall in love with him as a means to reach my mom, or if he was constructing a false reality purely to confuse and manipulate me, or if my mom had convinced him to flirt with her so that I would assume he was trying to get to me so that I might feel desirable 
or if he wasn't doing anything except being talkative and outgoing, and that his attractiveness was making me project flirtation onto everything he did. I didn't go to prom with Daniel. It was a joke, obviously. I had never had any misconception that it was anything other than a big, hilarious joke that I was definitely in on the entire time. That summer, someone handed me a bowl of ice cream with a spoon sticking out of it, like a dare. The spoon seemed forbidden and exotic to me, and I felt an urge to rebel. Rebel against myself, I guess, or rebel against the things I had convinced myself were important but were actually pointless. Or rebel against the fork industry, which I had inadvertently aligned myself with and was now regretting. But I had been clean and spoonless for ten months, and I was proud of that. It was stupid, I knew that, but it meant something to me. It meant I was capable. I had decided to do something, and despite the many bumps and twists in logic I had to employ along the way, I had done it. I had succeeded at something. Giving it up because I was embarrassed to admit who I was would be a step backward. I slowly brought a spoonful of ice cream up to my mouth and licked it, not touching the spoon with my tongue.